Americans nowadays are at risk of holding a historical memory of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that is tame and toothless. King's message wasn't that we, sh we should be nice to each other and get along. It wasn't about volunteering or picking up a litter. King's life and ministry and message was prophetic and challenging and controversial. King's life and ministry and message had to do with establishing what he believed Jesus' kingdom of heaven would look like here on earth. For King, such a kingdom of heaven would be impossible if we didn't abolish systemic racial injustice, eradicate economic exploitation, and cease wars of aggression. King's message was radical. As we come together this morning to celebrate King's 87th birthday, we will honor his life and ministry by imagining he came to Chapel Hill. If King were to visit us today, who would he meet with? Who would he talk to? What would he tell us about our town? What would he tell us about our life? In King's life, he worked to organize bus boycotts, voting rights marches, campaigns for workers who were exploited and treated without dignity. Come along this morning on a journey of celebration and imagination. Come along this morning on a journey of justice and dignity. Come along this morning as we listen for a prophetic voice in our time. Come, let us worship together. So what we're going to be doing this morning in, in three parts is we're going to be looking back at the history of the civil rights movement and the history of the life and ministry and message of, of Martin Luther King. And then we're going to be looking at contemporary parallels. That if King were to arrive in Chapel Hill today, 2016, what would he say about those issues today in our community? So 50 years ago, Martin Luther King helped to organize and lead a voting rights march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. At the time, African Americans were denied the right to vote. There were poll tests. If you want the right to vote, you have to pass a test and, and poll taxes. You had to give a large sum of money to vote. And voter intimidation, if you even tried to register to vote, you were putting your body and your life on the line. And so in Selma, Alabama, there was a march to draw attention to this injustice and to try to secure the passage of legislation guaranteeing all the right to vote. The right to vote is a prerequisite for all other rights. If you have a vote, you have a voice. Without the right to vote, your voice is weakened. And as Unitarian Universalists, we affirm the use of the democratic process. That's one of our sacred values. If King were to come to Chapel Hill, he'd probably notice here in our wider community an example of what political disenfranchisement does to a community. You just heard about the share the plate for the Rogers Eubanks Neighborhood Association, a historically African-American uh, neighborhood. I almost said a historically African-American neighborhood in Chapel Hill, except kind of part of it's in Carborough, and part of it is in unincorporated Orange County, and part of it's subject to the planning and building codes for Chapel Hill. And as a whole, it is a community whose political boundaries disempower, intentionally disempower the people who live there. And we find examples of that, that, that water and sewer services have not been built to that area. 
that uh, due to political disempowerment, a landfill was built there decades ago, a landfill that contributed to pollution of the water and the land, and then promises to convert after a certain number of years to convert that landfill into park and recreation space. Those, those promises were forgotten. And so today, and so today, we continue through our work this act of helping, of helping this historically African-American neighborhood to find its, uh, to be able to have political power through those who care. King would also, if he came to North Carolina, would probably say, just as he said in Selma, that voting rights in our state, here and now, need to be protected. He would look at laws designed to make it harder for some people to vote and call those laws unjust. He'd look at voter identification laws that make it harder for the very young and the very old, for students and those living in poverty to vote. He'd look at changes that, that restrict early voting and end same-day voter registration as attempts to suppress the African-American vote, suppress the minority vote, and take away voting rights from some. And if King came to Chapel Hill today, I believe he might ask us to do some things in order to promote voting rights. Fortunately, I was surprised when I came in this morning. I had no idea that there'd be an insert in your order of service. Bill, Bill took away the surprise by announcing it during the announcement, so I got to surprise, which is, uh, just, happened, just happens to be there. I, it was a surprise to me that it would be there. Um, and if you are a person who cares about voting rights, there are some things that you can do. First and, first and foremost on this, on this list, number, number one, I want to ask you to join me and to join the, the churches standing on the side of Love Committee and join hundreds of Unitarian Universalists from across North Carolina and join hundreds of Unitarian Universalists from across our country in Raleigh on February 13th. Um, I'm going to be getting on the bus as I did last year. It's a whole, whole lot of fun to travel with other Unitarian Universalists, and I hope that you will consider coming out. If King, when King came to Selma, it was to work for voting rights, and if King came to Chapel Hill today, believe that the enfranchisement, the political enfranchisement of all would continue, would continue to be something that he cared deeply about and that we, we should care deeply about as well. Before part two, let's sing. I invite you to stand in body or in spirit and join with me in singing hymn number 95, There Is More Love Somewhere. You all are, uh, are great singers. I could, I could listen to you sing all morning long. Good job. <coughs> So in 1968, February of 1968, the sanitation workers, the folks who drive the the garbage trucks in Memphis, Tennessee, went on strike. They went on strike because they were treated in their employment without justice. Among their concerns was being paid a a fair wage, a living wage, enough to make a living on, not being exploited for their labor. They're concerned about about worker safety. In fact, sanitation workers were told if you wanted to, if you needed to get out of the rain, just crawl in the back of the garbage truck and take shelter there. And and actually, some some of them were, were injured and even died doing that. And then they were concerned about, about dignity, what, what Unitarian Universalists we call, we affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person, that they were treated badly, that their humanity was not fully respected by those in the city. And so later that spring, Martin Luther King went to Memphis to join the 1,300 sanitation workers on strike there, on strike and you can imagine what would happen after a couple weeks of the garbage not being picked up. 
tons and tons and tons of garbage and, and a, a stench around the city. I think that if King came to Chapel Hill today, he would ask us questions about economic justice here and now. Chapel Hill may be a very small town. What's the population? I read 57,000 people live here, and that's when, that's when school's in session. It may be a very small town, but it's actually a huge driver of the economy, not only in this region, but, but in our entire state. Did you know that two of the ten largest employers in our state are located right here in Chapel Hill? The university, UNC Chapel Hill, is the fourth largest employer in the state. And the hospital, which uh, if, we could, if you could look through uh, that wall right there, you could see from here, is the ninth largest employer in the state. In fact, every, every day during the week, about 40,000 people come from outside of Orange County to come to work here. And so if King came to Chapel Hill, I think he'd ask questions about the economic justice of those who labor here. Along with um, a friend of mine who's here this morning, I'm going to point him out. Devin, would you, would you wave your hand? Devin, Devin Ross, if you want to st stand up, Devin. I'll just give you a little stand up. for a... Welcome, Devin. Good to see you. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, you don't, don't need to keep standing. That's okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, Devin is the, uh, is the lead organizer with uh, Justice United here in, here in town and um, struck up, yeah, good, good work, good organization. And, and I've, been, I've been meeting with him and we've been talking about what, what, we, might, what we might do. Is there, is there something that we might do kind of here very, very locally, intimately, about, about justice work and to kind of move ahead as a congregation in our, in our justice work and move ahead Justice United's aims um, and goals and the goals uh, across our community. Um, and so I was, having, I was having lunch with Devin and he uh, talked about, told me about this. He said that, you know, Chapel Hill is a, it's an amazing place to live um, and it's, it's not an, a, an affordable place to live. It's an expensive place to live. And, and as a justice issue, what if we imagine, what if we could imagine that, that every person who came here to work, who came here to work and make this, make this community thrive, actually lived an affordable housing wage, actually made enough to be able to forge you know, an apartment here. Um, and he shared with me some of the research that's been done that, that at the university, at the University of Chapel Hill, there are there are a thousand full-time employees, a thousand full-time employees who make less than what it costs to be able to afford an apartment here in Chapel Hill. And then he said at the hospital, at the hospital there are 1,800, 1,800 such uh, workers, workers who don't work, work there but don't, don't earn enough to be able to afford to live here in this community. And, and I thought, you know what, we're... We're awfully close. to it's, it's like two blocks that way. I remember my first day in ministry here, there was somebody who called from the hospital who was, who was, who was sick there, and, and I said, oh, I'll come over and visit. I'm, and I just walked right on over. What a great, great thing to be able to do. But every, every day, there is at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon or so, there's a shift change. <clears throat> and, and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of low-wage workers pour, pour out of the hospital to... Um, you know, get in buses to bring them back to the lots to, to drive back to the, the far-flung counties where they travel from to come here. And got to scheming, what if we were to hold, what if we were to hold a, a community meeting, go down there and talk or invite them to come here for cookies and, and lemonade in the afternoon and talk about what that experience is of, of working in this community but not, but not being a part of it of helping to make this, this, town, this town great, but then not getting to, to reap the benefits of that. And so Devin was like, would you, would you be up for hosting something? And I said, yes, count me in. And he said, do you think you could, do you think you could get 25 volunteers from your church? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I said, well, well, why don't we ask? And so, and so I'm asking. And so we're looking, we're looking at a date in, in early February to host a meeting. Would that be interesting to anybody? Would anybody be interested in that? If I put out the call to do that, well, there's the what you can do. So, so in, in Memphis, there was, 
1,300 sanitation workers who went on, on strike for human dignity. And here in Chapel Hill, we're asking today what we might do about the, the 2,800 employees of the two largest employers in the state who don't make enough to live here, who don't get paid an affordable housing wage. With that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to, to Glenn with the music, and we're going to have our Share the Plate offering um, for, the, for Rena, a really fabulous organization. All right, get out to the polls. In 1963, Martin Luther King went to Birmingham, Alabama, help lead a march working for desegregation, the city of Birmingham, helped organize a march through the downtown business district of Birmingham, and the marchers wanted to end segregation, wanted to end the practice of, of restaurants that wouldn't serve African Americans and hotels that wouldn't let African Americans stay in them, and stores where African Americans weren't allowed to shop, and drinking fountains for whites only, and swimming pools for whites only, and buses and trains. Today, thankfully, most of our laws say that it's, it's illegal to refuse service to anyone based on race. But that doesn't mean that everyone is treated equally today. And in fact, the, the laws that say everyone has to treat everyone, everyone equally often, often kind of disguise the fact or make it harder to, to find out when there is bias in how people are treated. During the fall, I was really struck by a lot of stories that were being published in the, in the local papers about how uh, white students and black students are, are treated differently in the school system. The, some of those stories talked about the, the education gap, that, that why is it? Why is it that we have different educational outcomes based on race? And no, it's not just about, it's not just about class and wealth, too, because if, even if you control for wealth, you've got different educational outcomes. And these stories also contained information about what happens when students of different races get into trouble at school. Someone ever, back in the day, did you ever get in trouble at school? Anybody ever get detention, get sent to the principal's office? All right. A few of the, you're going you're gonna, to um, understand what I'm saying. I see, I've got a a congregation full of, full of goody two-shoes, I think, here. <laughs> but these, these stories were, were alarming and disturbing. They talked about how, how black students are three times more likely to be sent to the principal's office than white students, and, and they're five times more likely to be given a suspension. And these asked the questions, why, why do we have this disparity in how people are treated? And let me say from the outset that I don't believe, I don't believe for a second that that any teacher, any school employee, any administrator, any principal begins the day or the week or the school year and says, I'm going to be unequal in how I go about my work. I don't think that's, that's, that's never been the heart of any teacher that I've known. Just like in a variety of other public services, public officials, I don't, I don't believe that they set out saying, I'm going to I'm going to do my work in, a, in an unjust way. But it does, it does occur to me that, that in that experience of, of school, I'm just going to take school discipline here and kind of that, that there are at every step of the way, there's decision points, really subjective decision points on the part of teachers and administrators. Does a teacher or a staff person choose to notice behavior or, or let it slide? If a teacher or a staff person notices, how, how do they engage? Does the issue resolve? Is it resolved in, in kind of a helpful way, or is there conflict? Does the conflict escalate? Does the teacher or cha- staff person choose to send the person to the office? How does the office respond? Does the office listen respectfully, or does it come down hard? Does the office choose a punishment or a warning? Does the office punish with a light punishment, a detention, or something even lighter than that, or is there a heavy punishment like a suspension? Each of those steps along the way, each decision point, there is subjectivity, and there is a choice. The good news, 
the good news is that since these stories have been coming out, the, the schools are beginning to, to take it seriously, are beginning to educate about implicit bias, and are beginning to, to work with teachers to help uh, ensure greater, uh, greater equality in how students are dealt with. And I think that as community members, I think that we can play an important role in, in helping to pursue this. Um, I think as parents, if we have a parent in the, in the public school system in Chapel Hill, Carborough, um, one thing that we can do is use our, our influence and use our connection to, to ask questions and to, uh, to inquire about what's being done. You know, at, at a teacher meeting, you know, what, can we do to, what can we do to get Jim's algebra grades up? Or what can we do to get, to get Susan into that AP class? What, what's being done? What's being done around, around bias and school discipline? Is there, is there work being done? And then even if you don't have a kid in the school system, there's things that we can do too by holding um, school board members and elected officials continuing to hold that as a, as a value that we hold as a community that we want to be encouraged. And so this morning I've talked about a variety of things that if King were to come to Chapel Hill today, you'd be alarmed about the lack of equality in, in how, in education, lack of equality and justice in employment, concern over voting rights that disenfranchise some. And I've sketched out a couple of things that you can do, that we can all do as members of this community to help bend the world greater, towards greater justice. And so with that, I uh, say thank you for listening and uh, let us go forth and do justice. I want to end with words of, of Martin Luther King and um, about this, I want to I say that in my, in my opinion, there are you know, a few truly great texts that have come out of the American experience. I, and this one, the letter from a Birmingham jail, I put up there with the Declaration of Independence, the Gettysburg Address, the poetry of Whitman, the poetry of Langston Hughes, and in this letter that King wrote in, in jail, he wrote it addressed to those who said with their voice that they wanted justice, but wouldn't get involved in the struggle. And, and I give these words, these are hard words that he says, and I give them to you to, to stir us up to stir up our spirits for the days and the weeks ahead. King writes, I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I've almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefer prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I, uh, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom. I had hoped that the white moderate would understand that law and order exist for the purpose of establishing justice, and that when they fail to do this in this purpose, they become the dangerously structured dams that block the flow of social progress. I would hoped that the white moderate would understand that the present tension is a necessary phase of the transition from an obnoxious, an obnoxious negative space in which the African-American passively accepted his unjust plight to a substantive and positive peace in which all men will respect the dignity and worth of human personality. We who engage in nonviolent direct action are not the creators of tension. 
We merely bring to the surface the hidden tension that is already alive. We bring it out in the open, where it can be seen and dealt with, like a boil that can never be cured so long as it is covered up, but must be opened with all its ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light. Injustice must be exposed, and with it all the tension its exposure creates to the light of human conscience and to the air of national opinion before it can be cured. Go forth and be that worker for justice who lives creatively and dynamically in the tensions of the world.